go ahead and get started with our session starting at 1.30, Rebuilding Connections. Um, a lot going on with being the co-host. I'm trying to minimize screens to stay. Okay, that's perfect. <laughs> All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kenesha L. Rowe. I'm the Assistant Dean of Students for Student Conduct and Inclusion Support. I've been working at AU for almost four years, and I work in the newly rebranded office of Student Accountability and Restorative Practices, which is formerly known as Student Conduct and Conflict Resolution Services. And I'm joined here today with my colleague who I would let introduce himself to you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I am Jarris Williams. I am the Associate Dean of Students and Director of Inclusion Support. Been at AU for about um, a decade in October. <laughs> And uh, I am situated in the office of the Dean of Students. Glad to have everyone join us this afternoon. Amazing. So today's presentation is dedicated to talking about rebuilding connections and how Jarius and I have applied restorative practices to enhance student well being, despite some students interacting with both of our offices on an occasion where students may interpret as them not operating as their best. The Office of Student Accountability and Restorative Practices, OSARP for short, holds students accountable through a variety of actions or services. And what you may already know about my office is that we hold students accountable through formal adjudication um, processes that look like disciplinary hearings, hearing level conferences, or disciplinary conferences. And if a student is held responsible for their actions, we assign a range of, of sanctions that are appropriate to that charge. What we have noticed about our community's needs and observed about students engaging with this process is that it occurs in a silo. Meaning because of FERPA regulations, we cannot disclose how we are holding students accountable or provide details about a student's process. And the dynamics of confidentiality created by FERPA can at times negatively impact a student's well being or a community's well being because of the loss of transparency there. As a result, OSARP has introduced an alternative way to hold students accountable using restorative justice and restorative practices principles. And what that looks like are three different pathways that students can experience. Uh, the first is informal resolution, restorative conferences or restorative conversations. And later on, I'm gonna talk more about each so that you can have a more context into what students may experience in either process. Within my functional area of student conduct, there are a number of ways that conflict can be managed and it's best illustrated using the spectrum of managing conflict. Uh, what you can see from this illustration is that conflict is managed on a spectrum where informally there may be little to no conflict management, which progresses towards formal adjudication, i.e. the student conduct process. And at times we can talk through conflict either through a debate or through discussion. At other times, we may need to have a facilitated dialogue or shuttle diplomacy where there's a neutral party interacting between the parties that have that are experiencing conflict. And restorative practices is in the middle of this spectrum. Um, restorative practices is slightly informal and slightly formal. And there are a set of guidelines that guide these conversations or processes that's not as formal as students who encounter disciplinary hearings. Overall, in managing conflict, how we approach misunderstanding does impact a student's well being. And in other words, there are students who are not adequately prepared or surrounded by support structures or systems to be able to perform well in a formal disciplinary hearing. Likewise, there are students who are not cognitively ready to participate 
in a restorative practices process. And by coercing or requiring that a student resolve a matter through any of these conflict pathways can have a negative implication on their personal and academic journey. And for those reasons, it's important to understand that our restorative practices processes are framed through philosophical underpinnings of restorative practices and restorative justice, as well as taking into account how a student is processing an incident. And so our restorative options um, have guidelines for each process that really uphold the integrity of restorative work. Before going a little further, I just wanted to make sure that we were all operating with the same interpretation and definition of restorative justice and restorative practices. And this is particularly important because when we talk about the services and the resources in our departments, it's important to use the correct term and language to set the right set of expectations for students in our response as an institution institution and for the process in which they're about to participate. So restorative justice is a term that is widely known in um, and also applied in some inaccurate ways. Restorative justice is a reactionary approach. It focuses on a process where those who are most directly or affected by wrongdoing um, come together to determine what needs to happen to repair harm or impact or to prevent a reoccurrence. Um, and then we have restorative practices. Both are grounded in this ecological ethos of interrelatedness and collaboration, but restorative practices is based on restorative justice principles. However, it's a continuum of practices that range from informal to formal behaviors that precede any wrongdoing. So in other words, what I'm referencing are the everyday ways that we engage with one another in creating community or sustaining our relationships, using effective statements, asking effective, effective questions. It's the use of emotional intelligence and emotional literacy to better relationships across a community um, or an institution. And restorative work will essentially shift the paradigm from a justice that harms the offender to a justice that creates healing, redefining a relationship or reintegrating an individual back into the community. This work of restorative practices is rooted in the foundational advances over several years at AU of understanding the impact and the need for restorative justice as a tool for healing within our community. And one of the benefits of COVID-2020 is that it allowed my office um, to prioritize mental health and engage with students and really reassess how we are creating um, and balancing mental mental health with balancing accountability and, and community standards. Uh, Pre-2020, we resolved some cases on an informal basis, and this varied from case to case with the outcomes. In 21-22, we piloted restorative solutions and we evaluated case criteria by analyzing AU student behaviors. And in 22-23, uh, my office was rebranded as Student Accountability and Restorative Practices. And as a result, there are distinctive ways that we can enhance student well-being through restorative conversations and restorative conferences. Uh, both pathways result from from conduct complaints. However, it's the application of restorative principles that allows OSARP to, discern, to determine through specific qualifiers. Um, and this is going to be evaluated on a case by case basis. Our restorative conversations are one on one informal conversations using philosophical underpinnings of restorative justice to process the incident and then explore students' decision in relation to the impact on others and the community. And restorative conferences are a 213 or 212 facilitated conversation that use restorative justice principles to understand the perspective of those involved. 
um, and to explore how the parties are impacted as a result of that harm. And the outcome of these conferences is a reparative agreement that is co-constructed by the parties and outlines how each person will move forward. There are guidelines uh, that I consider for resolution through a restorative conversation. Restorative conversations are scheduled when a student's behavior does not align with community standards. And we use restorative principles to meet with that student and to address their behavior. The types of behavior that we have used restorative conversations for include inappropriate levels of noise in the residence halls, uh, non-compliance with staff members or disorderly conduct that, disturb, that disturbs the learning or living environment. Um, students are then invited to have a restorative conversation with a staff member one-on-one. -on -one. And on average, what we're seeing is that these particular cases are being resolved within six to seven business days. And these conversations, yes, we are talking about a student's behavior, but oftentimes we also discover other dynamics that are occurring and then can connect them to resources or other support structures to support their overall success. And when a student has a restorative conversation with our office, a disciplinary record is not created for that student because we're not using our formal process to resolve that behavior. In other instances, when we receive a complaint that a student has engaged in prohibited conduct, we can use another set of guidelines to determine whether or not a restorative conference would be viable. Um, we consider a student's prior disciplinary history, whether or not that student is remorseful or taking responsibility for their actions, and this is determined in the intake meeting. Um, in the restorative conference, which is about an hour, uh, we need all of the willing participation from the parties who are impacted. In other words, it will be in direct conflict to have a restorative process where we're only meeting with the harmed party or only meeting with the responding party, which is what the student conduct process does when we only meet with the respondent for a disciplinary proceeding. Um, the timeline for resolution is what you see here. Here. Um, an incident will be reported to uh, OSARP. We then conduct intake meetings with the parties that are identified, and we internally determine whether or not a case would be suitable for a restorative resolution. If the case is appropriate, uh, we then move forward and schedule the restorative conference, in, at which, at the conclusion of the meeting, we can then arrive at this reparative agreement and then resolve the incident. We have supported students um, in understanding how their actions like vandalism, physical altercations, or roommate conflicts can impact the living and learning environments. On average for these conferences, we see them being resolved between 15 and 17 business days from the date that the student receives the invitation to the restorative process until the date that that case is closed. In these conversations, the responding party and the harmed party have an opportunity to share their perspective and then co-construct how they would like to move forward and redefine their relationship. Um, in these instances, the exchange of perspectives allows for either party to explore what has happened and then have an increased understanding of their role and actions on an individual but also a community-based level. Over the past two years, we have uh, dramatically increased our application of restorative processes to support student well being. This past year alone, we engaged in 151 restorative processes, uh, 75 intake meetings, which then resulted in 20 restorative conferences. And it's important to note here, if you are um, a data person and looking at analytics, that just because we have an intake meeting does not guarantee that the result will be a restorative conference because of those philosophical underpinnings that I referenced earlier. 
Um, however, we were still able to engage in 56 conversations with students, restorative conversations. And as we move into the next academic year alone, I only hypothesize that these numbers will continue to grow. So some of the benefits for well-being include the transparency um, during the accountability process. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, whereas FERPA prohibits uh, OSARP from discussing the case with others, um, including some campus partners, the restorative conference process allows for more transparency in receiving the complaint and then working through the incident with those most directly impacted. Um, students' affect or ability to process incidents dictates their pathway and the resolution. So students won't be forced into a restorative process unless they're fully ready to explore that conversation. Um, we also protect other students from unforeseen harm through that preparation, through our intake meetings, and through individual reflection, as well as having structured conferences uh, with two trained facilitators. And then lastly, students are able to co-construct the reparative agreement and the way that they reintegrate into a relationship or to a community. So with the restorative conference facilitators, each party gets the opportunity to provide recommendations on how to move forward, whether that is restitution, a verbal apology, um, if it's new boundaries in a relationship, or a new community standards. And at this time, um, I will hand it over to my colleague, Jaris, who will talk about how the Dean of Students supports uh, students' well-being on campus. Sure. Thank you, Kenesha. So uh, the Office of the Dean of Students supports students through a number of different initiatives. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on three specific areas, and I've started with some terminology just to make sure that we're all on the same page about what specifically I'm referencing when I start discussing these areas. To start, um, I want to mention consultative services. We'll talk a little bit more about this a bit later on, but uh, this service provides recommendations to infuse restorative principles into program, curriculum, office structure. Um, so the idea is, again, to uh, infuse restorative principles into the day-to-day -day activities um, there. Uh, the next uh, service that I wanna be specific with referencing is um, it's framed student services, but includes multiple different types of services as well. Um, so group facilitated dialogues, we'll talk about that. Restorative circles, we'll talk about that. Um, individual student dialogues, um, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what that means as well. And then community disruption meetings. All of these types of services uh, includes and reference student services, the overarching term there. And then finally, you'll see uh, learning environment restoration. And this specific terminology really is referenced for uh, faculty and the academic science, the academic side of the house, uh, program uh, managers, associate deans. Uh, we've provided these services uh, specifically to all three. So in this case, um, this provides uh, services to faculty, program directors, associate deans after a disruptive incident happens inside of the classroom. Um, and this focuses on a couple of different things, reintegrating the disruptive student, um, repairing the learning environment, and then uh, having ongoing conversations to determine what the best next steps are so that the faculty member can teach the course accordingly and support all students and that the students feel heard, valued and respected in that learning space. So these are the three services that we're gonna uh, kind of dive in a little, a little more deeper about. Uh, to start, uh, student services. So you heard facilitated group dialogues. So this is in particularly with facilitated group dialogues and restorative circles, these must be initiated by students. So we realize there are times where staff and faculty say, hey, I have this situation. This would be a great conversation to, uh, for you all maybe to assist with facilitating. And while that faculty or staff member may be right, the principles of restorative uh, 
the restorative principles lead students to lead the charge there. And so we're not just going to force our way upon a group uh, dynamic situation. This has to be requested by the students. Um, a facilitated group dialogue. Um, it's really the idea is to serve as a conduit to assist with communication barriers so that the conversation can be rich in a way that may not be if there was not a third party independent human there uh, kind of assisting with the flow of the dialogue. And the intent is to improve uh, dialogue efficacy, obviously. Um, this is not specifically designed to produce a reparative agreement. As you heard Kanisha mentioned a little earlier, different types of services render different types of learning outcomes and uh, ultimately things that we are hoping to get at the end of each service. So um, facilitated group dialogue typically is not uh, conducive to a reparative agreement. Restorative student dialogue and community disruption meetings. So if you think of situations where we have disruptive students or students who, or a student who has caused pretty significant harm within our community, um, there are times that that specific context is not amenable to a circle or a group dialogue, a facilitated group dialogue. And when that happens, we don't just close our eyes and say, okay, the situation's over, we can't do anything. We will take it the next step further and still have conversations with the student who caused the harm so that we can discuss a few things. Um, things like, uh, how does your behavior impact the community? Are, do you feel like you have uh, obligations to the community. Um, what was the community impact? Um, referrals to other university resources. We've seen that a lot of students who engage in some of these behaviors need additional supports and referrals on campus as well too. So these are, uh, we'll also discuss uh, our student conduct code, behavioral expectations moving forward. So again, just because a circle or a group dialogue is not happening doesn't mean we're still not infusing these, these restorative principles on an individual basis. Okay, uh, next is the restorative circle. Um, this will, this, the idea of this is also to be initiated by the student. I'll show you a quick depiction momentarily about that process, but this provides an opportunity for the community to convene in response to harm. So if you think about some of the big incidents that have happened on campus, um, that could provide an opportunity for us to come together, for us to determine what happened, how to make things right, what was the impact on each other, and more importantly, for other people to hear and, uh, Think about your experience as well too, and how we are all a part of one community here at American University. Um, and then in this specific, specific context, the restorative circle would be conducive uh, to a reparative agreement. That's the outcome, that's the end outcome that we would hope to gain out of a restorative circle. Um, and I mentioned I wanted to provide a brief, uh, just a uh, visual depiction of our restorative circle process. So this is what it looks like. I'm not going to review this in detail, but I do want you guys to see kind of some of the uh, other offices and how collaborative this process is. It'll start with a student request. Then Kanisha and I will review to make sure whatever the context is, is appropriate to move forward with a circle. Then we'll collaborate with our Equity Title IX office. We'll also collaborate with um, ASAC. Then we'll think about um, what our process includes in terms of uh, uh, intake meetings and scheduling and um, crafting a reparative agreement and then notifying everyone if we do make it that far to a reparative agreement, sending that notification of restoration out um, and then sending the reparative agreement out to everyone. So I thought this was important for you all to see the process here. It is a thought out process that uh, is very collaborative here. Okay, so next is learning environment restoration. So again, the idea of this service is to assist the faculty member and the learning environment to be conducive to all students feeling included, and more importantly, being able to learn and take away the core components of that course. So things that uh, we, I typically will ask a faculty member to think about uh, is, is the student's behavior impacting the faculty member from teaching other students? All students have the ability and should have the ability to learn and to feel valued inside of the classroom. Is the behavior getting worse? Um, is this the second or third time um, that something has happened? Um, we wanna know context, that, that will be really helpful with, with helping us to help the faculty member. Does the behavior place anyone at risk? Physical safety versus emotional safety. That's very important because we hear a lot of students say, yes, 
Um, I am safe physically from this person, but emotionally and mentally, I am not because the nature of what my identities are. So it's very important to kind of understand the totality of the context um, from that faculty member as well. Um, in what way has the situation impacted the learning community at large? And then does that faculty member have a plan of recourse? Have they done anything? It's fine if you have not, but the idea is to um, let us know if you need help and if you have not done anything so that we can start to develop a game plan as quickly as possible, because typically these classes meet every other day or a couple of times a week and there's not much time to do so, right? Uh, moving forward, uh, there are two, obviously two separate conversations that typically will happen when we discuss learning environment restoration. One is with the faculty member, one is with the student. So I thought this might be important for you all to kind of understand a bigger picture of how we support faculty once we uh, are in consultation and communication with that faculty member. So again, understanding what harms occurred, what impact, what was the impact to the community, what steps was taken, uh, what's the faculty member hoping for? And a lot of times, a lot of faculty members want students to be removed immediately. And that uh, typically does not happen. It's an anomaly when we're able to remove a student uh, immediately. And so what that means is that, again, the class could be the next day or maybe it's a Monday and the class is reconvening again on a Wednesday. There's not much time for us to develop a game plan. Um, so I, I, I typically like to know what is the faculty member hoping for, interim and then long term, and then explain the student removal policy. So everything that I just mentioned. Um, on the student side, uh, similarly, having a conversation with the student to discuss their experiences from their own unique perspective in, within that learning environment. Um, reiterating course specific behavioral expectations outlined by the syllabus and the OSARP student conduct code. So uh, believe it or not, a lot of our students don't enter the classroom environment with the understanding that they want to be disruptive. In my experience, it's usually because either an accommodations issue or a psychological issue that the student is kind of managing and that class is either triggering or something about the learning environment that they don't feel like the faculty member is aware of and or they feel like that their behavior is acceptable because of that. Um, so these are all things that uh, I speak about directly with the student. And then finally, summarizing those expectations with the student. So at the end of these conversations, I typically will send a memo to the student outlining what they articulated, what they're hoping for, what, what they suggested their behavior is gonna be moving forward so that if there are additional uh, disruptions, we are able to move in a different way um, and particularly with thinking about um, conduct charges at that point. Sorry. Okay, so um, what options do faculty members have after a dis after uh, a student is disruptive. So I, I've one of the themes that you've heard me mention is discussing the inclusive reintegration plan with uh, DOS. Um, so the idea is we want to be inclusive with our language, how we reintegrate that student, um, you know, what we're saying to the class. We want to still try to make everyone feel valued, but we also want to reintegrate that student and address the behavior as well. Potentially a behavioral contact with the contract with the student, um, a consultation with psychological uh, counseling and psychological service. We have multiple faculty members who don't understand certain behavior and um, it's perfectly admissible to reach out to our counseling and psychological services to consult as well too. If there are any threats, um, consulting with uh, campus police, police, and then also uh, class debriefing and coaching. So this is something that uh, probably is, probably the one of the larger time taking um, resources that I've provided to faculty members is to really help them think about how to react in certain situations, what they should do, what might make the learning community worse in certain contexts, and what they can do from a student conduct code perspective. Um, potentially, if applicable and with and, and in accordance to with the program director and associate dean, reassignment to another course section, um, resources for the student faculty members in class, and um, ultimately, if the behavior is consistent and pervasive, a student conduct code complaint with an interim suspension. Um, but that is, again, the last resort. We try to really uh, assist the community with restoring, um, with restoration. Um, other pieces of 
information that I provide to faculty um, is designing a syllabus that sets the stage. You wanna be consistent. You wanna make sure that students understand from the very beginning what, how, and why certain things in your class is set the way that it is, uh, creating ground rules, um, modeling respectful communication, um, responding to disruptive behavior in a timely manner. I think letting things, I, what I've seen is some faculty allowing things to fester for weeks, um, sometimes in the middle of the semester, and then they're like, I can't take this student anymore, but it's kind of been a buildup to the behavior. Um, and then mentioning and focusing on the student's behavior as opposed to diagnosing the student with some type of a health concern, um, that's big as well. Uh, and then expecting uncomfortable conversations. Another thing that I've seen with faculty is that uh, because they are the authority and the expert subject matter, um, sometimes vulnerability in a way of being challenged is difficult for some faculty members, but um, expecting to have uncomfortable conversations um, and thinking proactively about if and when something like that happens is really important. Um, also, um, understanding the variance of identities that students bring to campus Kanisha mentioned a little earlier just about how many students uh, started virtually from when they were in high school and now they're here. Some of our students haven't been equipped with the uh, verbal and uh, social um, resiliency that other students have and may be less comfortable addressing things in the classroom. And so I think it's important that faculty, member, un faculty members understand the range of uh, identities there. And then know your, knowing your campus partners and recognizing them as experts. So you can always reach out to me if there is a faculty member or a staff member who is having difficulties um, with students and we can maybe help provide consultation services and so forth. And don't be afraid to ask for help. That's the other unique part is that some people just feel like they have to do it on their own. And while we would certainly support you taking initiative within your expert area, you also have campus partners who are here to help you. All right, moving forward to uh, consultative services. Uh, these really focus on, um, again, infusing restorative principles into the day-to-day. -day. So some examples here would be um, how do I fuse restorative language into my office structure, curriculum, or program model? These are things that Kanisha and I have both assisted offices with uh, in the past. How do I create restorative learning outcomes? So if um, I know that I'm going to be addressing behavior um, and I want to create restorative learning outcomes, what should I be thinking about? Um, do I need a timeline on, on uh, assessing if that's happening or if it hasn't happened? All of these things I think is important with uh, understanding restorative learning outcomes. And then how do I create opportunities to repair harm? That's the big thing. The, one of the biggest theme that you should have gotten today is that the idea is to repair harm, affirm people's voices. Um, and this is what we wanna do. Um, also, how do I create an internal framework to resolve similar issues in the future? What I've seen is that a lot of uh, office structures are, not equipped to deal with things proactively, and that's where we can help. We wanna to try to assist you all proactively if there's any um, propensity to have disagreement and or conflict and or uh, issues, some of the issues that we've previously discussed. And then finally, um, I wanted to just provide also a year in review. Uh, so you'll see uh, our terminology that we previously mentioned, consultative student services and restorative learning. Um, you can disregard the programmatic services because that's not a service that the general AU public can ask for. But uh, there were 34 unique restorative requests submitted this past year, and there were 71 total restorative meetings throughout the academic year. So uh, I wanted to separate the reports from the actual number of meetings, and there were, so there were 71 uh, total restorative meetings. Um, and these data is not reclusive, or I'm sorry, are not inclusive of the restorative conference numbers that Kanisha mentioned a little bit earlier. So uh, we had 18 total consultative, 26 total student services, and 23 uh, restoring learning environment. Uh, Excuse me, thank you. One other final piece, I wanted to show you all how to uh, access some of the uh, restorative consultative or training services. So this is the main Office of the Dean of Students uh, webpage. If you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see restorative practices. Um, you'll click request restorative practices. And then uh, 
This is how students would actually request a restorative circle and they'll have to log in with their AU credentials. But if you'd like to discuss uh, restorative consultations or trainings, you click on this workshop, this workshop tab and then it will direct you to um, which service that you'd like to request, right? Jairus, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, we cannot see your screen, what you're showing. We can see your PowerPoint, but we don't see that, uh, what, you're, what you're trying to demonstrate here. Interesting, thank you. Okay, so uh, I will send this out. Sorry, I will send that, I will send this information out um, here and then, uh, it's really, you go to the Office of the Dean of Students Office webpage, scroll down to the bottom, and then um, it'll take you to our workshops page and you click that in, that tab and you'd uh, request whatever service that you were hoping for. But I will send this out to the group. Questions, thoughts, um, anything that we could help clarify for you all while you're here. Sure, Mac. I see your I see your hand. Yeah. Um, thanks for the information. It was really it was really helpful. I didn't even know this office existed. Um, so that's it's it's nice to hear about. Um, I uh, was wondering what do so I both uh, both of you talked about how you know the students really need to buy into these practices in order to use them effectively, which is you know very very clear. Um, what do, what happens if the students aren't buying in? What's the you know what's the path forward if they're if they're maybe not ready for these types of conversations or they're just very resistant to it? Like, what's kind of the different um, approach then? What I've seen is um, an inaccurate understanding of why they would not buy in, because in most cases students want another person to acknowledge how they were hurt. They want a public um, encounter to exchange or express how it impacted them. Um, I think what's missing prior to these services is the structure and systems for that to happen. Um, so it will take some time in shifting that paradigm for students to understand, okay, DOS and OSARP have these services. This is one way that I can engage with that. That's gonna be a cultural shift that will happen slowly. Um, but when we meet with students, and this is for um, the behaviors that rise to the level of a conduct complaint, um, we explain and re-educate students what the benefits are of engaging in this process. Um, some of those benefits I shared before, mainly being the exchange of perspectives, and it's not someone else dictating how you get to move forward. You actually have a say in that. And I think when students are exposed to the fact that there are options and that it's a collaborative process, they want to be involved. But I won't say that works 100% of the time because that hasn't always happened. And and when that doesn't happen, sometimes students want to learn the hard way. And that is unfortunate when we can save them some of those harder uh, learning uh, lessons. And so there are students who have said, I don't want to engage in the restorative process for whatever reason, even though we as professionals um, that are student-centered, we know the benefits of that. If a student doesn't want to engage, we're not going to coerce them to engage. So if the behavior does rise to the level of a conduct complaint, we still have our formal process to address that behavior. And I think traditionally when students um, think about the conduct process or the implications of the outcome of a conduct process, that's a very scary thing for students to navigate. They usually don't want to engage with our office. They are apprehensive as to how this will impact their reputation or their relationships or future careers. So there's actually a lot that we can create buy-in for and having students understand. It's when they have inaccurate understandings or knowledge 
knowledge that then create these barriers that we then have to help students overcome together. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll also add that to my sentiments about some of the uh, restorative individual restorative dialogues, uh, just because maybe a student who caused harm does not want to engage with peers, um, there are opportunities to still reinforce the restorative principles with that student. So we, we're, there are contexts where we are not just suggesting that, okay, students can't meet for whatever reason, whether it's the student who caused harm or whether it's other students just don't wanna meet with that person. And we're not going to attempt to infuse some of those restorative uh, underpinnings with the student who caused the harm. Um, so I, I wanted to add that as well, too. I actually think that in, in my experience, that's one of the pieces that um, people just don't are, are unaware of. Um, if, a, if a circle or a dialogue is not taking place, I think some folks just think that that's the end. And, and it's really not. It, it's, it's not the end because we still will circle back with the student who caused harm if we are aware who caused the harm and still have those conversations with that student. It's a great question. Other thoughts, questions, things you all don't, might not necessarily understand that you would like more context to. While we're here, can you all see my screen now? Okay, perfect. All right, so um, I don't know what was happening a moment ago, but this is the Office of the Dean of Students uh, main webpage. What you do uh, to my previous sentiments about requesting consultative services or uh, trainings, you just scroll all the way down to where it says request restorative practices, click on this. And then um, as I was mentioning before, it's two options are restorative circle, request a restorative circle. This is for students and students only. Um, and it will take them to the main web page to submit a report. And then the other option is workshops. You click on the workshops, the workshops uh, tab, and then you'd see facilitators training, restorative practices 101. Um, you'd add your name, email address, the total number of participants. And then you talk to us a little bit about like what you're hoping for with this. Um, and if it is a restorative consultation, um, you know, we would, or whatever the service is, one of us or a designee will be back in touch with you to learn more about uh, the timeline of when you were hoping to uh, have the training or consultative service, uh, what the context is, and uh, so forth. So I just wanted to just underscore that part to make sure that we all were on the same page with that. If there are no more questions, I know that there was a request for us to share some of these slides. So we will certainly make that accessible through um, our support here. Um, so you should be able to receive those slides. If you have any additional questions or if it is middle of September and you meet with a student and you're like, I think something restorative will be useful in supporting that student's well-being or offering them some options. You can certainly reach out to dos at american.edu or conduct at american.edu. And either way, we'll be, because we work so closely together, we'll be able to figure out what is the best pathway for this student. It may require us getting some additional information from you into context, because the last thing that we want is for a student to be referred to our office without them knowing that they were referred and without there being some exchange of information. And so if we need um, to do some follow-up with you or some consultation, we just ask that you um, be available because resolving these matters in an adequate time frame is very imperative to the success of these processes and supporting students. I want to thank everyone for thank attending, and I think your next session starts at 2.20, so you have about five minutes until the next session starts. Thank you all. Thank you.